The question of tonight's debate is, do relations of authority and submission exist eternally among the persons of the Godhead? For the first time in the young history of the Trinity debates, we have four debaters rather than two. Two of the four are teamed up to argue an affirmative answer. Yes, the relations of authority and submission do exist eternally among the persons of the Godhead. The other two debaters have teamed up to argue the negative answer. No, these relations do not exist eternally among the persons of the Godhead. On the yes side, we have two former professors from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Drs. Wayne Grudem and Bruce Ware. It is indeed a little unusual to have two prodigal sons returning home. <laughs> I'd have to ask the other debate group here, but I don't think Drs. McCall and Yandel plan to throw them a party. Is that right? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, enough fun. Uh, allow me to introduce our participants for tonight's debate. On the yes side, we have um, uh, Dr. Grudem, who uh, presently serves as research professor of Bible and theology at Phoenix Seminary in Arizona. He's the author of numerous articles and books. Perhaps among his most well-known publications are his widely used Systematic Theology, published in 1994 with Zondervan, and his book, Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, co-authored with John Piper and recently published with Crossway Books in 2006. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Wayne Grudem. <laughs> Joining him on the affirmative side is Dr. Bruce Ware. He is professor of Christian theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Like Dr. Grudem, he too is well published in the field of theology, and I won't take the time to mention all of their, his publications here, but I will mention one for obvious reasons, because it's particularly relevant to the debate tonight. That book is entitled Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Relationships, Roles, and Relevance, a Crossway Book, 2005. Please join me in extending a warm Trinity welcome to Dr. Bruce Ware. Okay, on the no side of the debate, we have Drs. Thomas McCall and Keith Yandel. Many of you are probably already familiar with, uh, with both of these two professors. Dr. McCall is an assistant professor of theology here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's, uh, he teaches widely in the fields of theology and apologetics and some philosophy. He has two forthcoming books uh, of note. Which Trinity, Which Monotheism, Systematic and Philosophical Theologians on the Metaphysics of Trinitarian Theology. This is forthcoming with Erdman's. He is co-editor with Michael Ray from Notre Dame of These Three Are One, Philosophical and Theological Essays on the Trinity. That's forthcoming with Oxford University Press in 2009. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas McCall. Last but not least, Dr. Keith Yandel. He's also well known to these parts and is a respected current uh, member of the Trinity community. He teaches courses in philosophy, theology, religion on a regular basis here at TEDS. He is presently the Julius R. Weinberg Professor of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. His published works, are, again, are too numerous to mention. I'll mention two of his influential ones in, in the past uh, 20 years here would be The Epistemology of Religious Experience, which is published with Cambridge in 1994, and Philosophy of Religion, a Rutless publication in 1999. Please, once again, join me in thanking Dr. Keith Yandel. The uh, Trinity Bookstore asked me to announce, I don't think you could have missed them in the back there, some of these books are available at, at a discounted price and some other related items out there if you want to take a look at that. Last year we held a very important and highly successful debate between 
Dr. Paul Nitter and Dr. Harold Netlin on the question, can a Christian be a religious pluralist? One of the things that emerged forcefully in that debate was the real need for the evangelical Christian community to maintain clarity and precision in its understanding of the doctrine of God, both in terms of its Christology and Trinity. This is where tonight's debate picks up in earnest. The doctrine of the Trinity is arguably the most central and distinctive feature of the Christian faith. With such a distinguished group of theologians in our midst, I will not take the time here to unpack the doctrine and, the surrounding, and its surrounding issues in any great detail. The opening statements will provide uh, enough in that regard. What I want to do instead is just to give the audience a few questions to keep in mind as this debate proceeds. First, which position best reflects the biblical witness? Second, which position is the most reasonable or rationally cogent? Third, should the Christian simply stick with the, uh, sorry, should the biblical witness and rational cogency be thought to conflict with one another? Should the Christians simply stick with the confessional norms of the church? If so, which position resonates best with the historic position of the church? If not, how revisionist of these norms should evangelical Christians be? Now let's get down to the formal structure of the debate. I should note that what we expect here, more than a knock down and drag them out debate, is an engaging dialogue between four notable thinkers on the doctrine of the Trinity. We have asked each group to begin with a 30 minute opening statement that would give roughly 15 minutes to each person. These opening statements were prepared beforehand and without specific knowledge of what the other persons would say. They were then distributed to each side five days ago. After the two 30-minute opening statements, each group will have 10 minutes to respond, followed by two sets of five-minute responses to the responses. After this initial dialogue, we will open the remaining time for questions from the audience. The whole debate, I suspect, will last roughly two hours. I will be reminding each person of the remaining time for each section throughout the debate. You might hear my little voice in the background. You've got a two minutes, something along those lines. So without further ado, we can get started. By prearrangement, doctors Grudem and Ware will begin. I've got, a, I've got my watch somewhere here, and I'm going to start it now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Firestone, and thank all of you uh, for being here, and the Carl F. H. Henry Center for sponsoring this debate, and uh, Dr. McCall, whom I just met, and Dr. Yandel, who he and I have known each other for 25 years, something right. like that. So it's good to be with you. Do relations of authority and submission exist eternally among the members or the persons of the Godhead? We are going to argue yes. First, because scripture indicates the authority of the Father and the submission of the Son to the Father's authority from before the foundation of the world to the eternal state. Point A, authority and submission prior to creation. Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He chose us, he the Father, chose us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Other verses support this idea. Romans 8, 29. The Father predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. 2 Timothy 1, 9. God saved us and called us to a holy calling because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, pro chronon ionion. And here we have an insight into what's happening in the Trinity before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 9 to 11, the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, there was predestination as well. And uh, Ephesians 3, 11 talks about an eternal purpose of God to bring us salvation. The point of all this is that before the ages began, 
before the creation of the world, when there was nothing except God himself, what happened in the eternal counsels of the Trinity? The Father planned to save us through his Son and in his Son. He planned that his Son would be our Savior and we would be conformed to his image. The role of planning, purposing, predestining, in fact, the entire history of salvation belongs to the Father in its uh, in its planning and purposing, there is no hint of any such authority for the Son with respect to the Father. There is full deity for the Son, taught in many places in Scripture. There is glory for the Son, but the authority to plan salvation and to decide to send the Son is an authority that Scripture attributes to the Father only. B, authority and submission indicated by the eternal names, Father and Son. We could put hundreds of verses up to talk about the names Father and Son. John 1.14, glory is of the only Son from the Father. These names reflect an eternal distinction in persons, and Jesus could, in fact, give us some insight into the relationship between Father and Son prior to the foundation of the world, because in John 17.24, he talks about the love of the Father for him before the foundation of the world. The Father did not suddenly become Father. Think about these names. The Father did not suddenly become Father when he sent the Son into the world or when he created the world. To say that would be to say that the personal distinctions among the members of the Trinity are not part of God's eternal character. No, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally. And the biblical concept of name is very important because it reveals the character of the person named. And so in those names, there is clear indication of an eternal difference in authority. The names Father and Son designate an eternal priority to the Father, a greater authority to plan, purpose, and initiate an authority which is not said to be shared by the Son or the Holy Spirit. No. In the context of the biblical world, this would be even more evident. With extended families and the recognized leadership of the Father, the Father and Son, the names Father and Son, would certainly have implied authority for the Father and submission to that authority for the Son. Kevin Giles, an Australian author, in his book Jesus and the Father, says, no, the names Father and Son don't indicate authority and submission, but intimacy and equality. My response is to say that Giles is attempting to remove a component of the father-son relationship that is part of that relationship everywhere in the biblical text and the biblical world. If all, those, if all Jesus wanted to talk about was intimacy and identical authority, he could have spoken of my friend in heaven or my brother in heaven. Those images were ready at hand in the culture, but he did not. He spoke of my father in heaven. Giles also objects that arguing for the father's authority by analogy to human father-son relationship, is exactly like the Arian error of speaking of the son as begotten and thereby arguing that the son was created. In response, the rest of Scripture guards against and prohibits that idea because the rest of Scripture prohibits the idea of the son as a created being. So that aspect of an earthly father-son relationship cannot be true of God. But it's different with authority and submission because the rest of Scripture doesn't prohibit the idea of authority and submission in a father-son relationship. It rather confirms it. Point C, authority and submission in the process of creation. Here's a pattern again. All things were made through him or the father through whom he created the world, through the son, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Uh, The son through whom he created the world. This follows the same pattern. The role of initiating, leading belongs to the father. And it wasn't just in the incarnation, because this is uh, in the process of creation. Point D, authority and submission prior to Christ's earthly ministry. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but but it does indicate that when God gave his son, John 3.16, he had to be the father in order to give the son. He He had to be father and son before the father could give his only son. Galatians 4, 4, God sent forth his son. 1 John 4, uh, God sent his son into the world. Now, there are other verses, but Kevin Giles, again, objects that these sending verses, Father sending the son, do not imply greater authority. He says it's, it's a Hebrew shaliach concept or a messenger concept that applies equal authority for the messenger as well as the one sending the messenger. But Giles, unfortunately, misunderstands the concept of Jewish shalia, or messenger, for two reasons. First, it it refers to the authority of the messenger with with respect to the persons to whom the messenger is sent. 
it never means that when a king sends a messenger to a group of people, the messenger has equal authority to the king himself. That's a misuse of the concept of shaliach. And second, this idea of a messenger was heavily dependent on the Old Testament verses that God, where God speaks of sending the prophets. And none of the prophets would ever have thought they were equal in authority to God himself. E, authority and submission in Christ's earthly ministry. Dr. McCall, Dr. Yandel, and I, and Dr. Ware all agree that while Jesus was here on earth, he submitted to the Father. He came to do the will of him who sent me. Um, he speaks uh, not on his own authority, but as the Father have ta has taught him. He kept the Father's commandments. I will not belabor that because we agree on that point. F, authority and submission after Christ's ascension into heaven. Was Jesus only subject to the Father while he was here on earth? No. First, he continues as great high priest. Hebrews 7.25 he always lives to make intercession for them. The word for uh, to make intercession, entugkano, means to make earnest appeal on behalf of someone. And it is used in other contexts in the New Testament outside of um, an inferior making an appeal to a superior, such as the Jewish people making frequent petitions to King Festus. Well, that was an appeal. And that's the verb that is used here of Jesus interceding for us. Same verb is used in Romans 8.34. So, Jesus interceding for us as high priest shows that he is subject to the authority of the one to whom he brings those requests. Second, in his pouring out of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Jesus is subject to the authority of the Father. Um, so Peter can say in Acts 2.33, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are now seeing and hearing. Jesus received the authority to send the Holy Spirit but he received it from the Father. Third, in his receiving revelation from the Father after his ascension into heaven. Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Fourth, <clears throat> there is a post-ascension submission to the authority of the Father, seen in Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, a position of authority second to the Father himself. Acts 2. 32, 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. Ephesians 1, 20, the Father raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand. Hebrews 1, 3, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The background is Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. To sit at the right hand of Yahweh is not a position of equal authority, for Yahweh the Lord is still the one commanding and still the one subduing enemies. But it is a position of authority at the right hand, second only to the Lord, the king and ruler of the entire universe. This idea of sitting at the right hand of someone can also be seen in Psalm 45, where of the king it is said, at your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Or in Matthew 20, verse 20 and <clears throat> 21, where the mother of the sons of Zebedee comes and says to Jesus, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. It would be preposterous to think she is asking that they would be equal in authority to Jesus himself, but she is asking that they would be second only to him. This is confirmed by the way Jesus was given authority over the nations by the Father in the book of Revelation, where he says, Revelation 2.27, I myself have received authority from my Father. Then point G, authority and submission after the final judgment. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 to 28. Verse 28 says, when all things are subjected to him, the Son, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Here is an indication of what will happen after the final judgment, when all enemies are destroyed and we enter into the eternal state. Just to be sure, there is no misunderstanding. Paul specifies that it was always the Father who always had ultimate authority, for it was the Father who subjected all things to the Son. All things, that is, except the Father himself. Because verse 27 says, He is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. And then also, as has been true, since before the foundation of the world, the Son will also again and eternally be subject to the authority of the Father forever. Conclusion from Scripture. The Son has been subject to the authority of the Father in eternity past, as the Father chose us in the Son 
predestined us in the Son, planned the entire history of salvation that would be carried out by the Son. This was, as Paul says, the eternal, eternal purpose of the Father. And that reflects an eternal distinction in role between the Father and the Son. It was also evident in eternity past, as evidenced by the eternal names, Father and Son. The, the uh, Son was subject to the Father in creation, as the Father created through the Son. The Father planned and directed, and the Son carried out the will of the Father. The Son was subject to the Father prior to the Incarnation, because he was subject to the Father so that he could be the one whom the Father would give and send into the world. The Son was subject to the Father during Christ's earthly ministry, for the Son was always obedient to the Father. <clears throat> the Son continues subject to the Father after Christ's ascension into heaven, where he intercedes before the Father on our behalf as our great high priest, where he receives authority to pour out the Holy Spirit on the church at Pentecost, where he receives revelation from the Father to deliver it to the church in the book of Revelation, where he is continually, repeatedly at the right hand of the Father. And he will be subject to the authority of the Father after the final judgment when Paul explicitly says he will be subjected to him who put all things in subjection to him. These relationships are never reversed. Not once in the entire Bible. The Son does not predestine us in the Father. The Son does not create through the Father. The Son does not send his only Father into the world. The Father does not come and obey the Son's will. The Father does not sit at the Son's right hand. The Father does not pray to the Son or intercede for his people before the Son. In the Bible, this is not what sons do. They do not rule or have authority over their fathers. They obey their fathers. They are subject to their fathers. The consistent, uniform testimony of Scripture is that the Father, by virtue of being Father, eternally has authority to plan, initiate, command, and send. Authority that the Son and Spirit do not have. The Son, by virtue of his being Son, eternally submits joyfully and with great delight to the authority of his Father. This may seem strange or even wrong in a modern culture that resists authority and submission, but it is the uniform testimony of Scripture. Authority and submission to authority are a wonderful part of the great glory of the Father and the Son, and this will be their glory for all eternity. Do relations of authority and submission exist eternally among the persons of the Godhead? Absolutely, undeniably, gloriously, yes. And further confirmation of support comes from the Church Fathers and others through the history of the Church. The Nicene Creed has spoken of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, begotten, not made, being of one substance, homoousius, with the Father. And uh, the Chalcedonian Creed, Athanasian Creed, 39 Articles, Westminster continue this same language. Uh, interestingly, the Philadelphian Confession adds this caveat. One God who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several particular relative properties and personal relations. In, in speaking about the eternal beginning of the Son, Jeffrey Bromley, one of the great church historians of the 20th century, uh, translator of BART and TDNT, has said this, that eternal generation, generation refers to the divine sonship prior to the incarnation, and thus, thus a distinction of persons within the one Godhead. And that between these persons, there is a superiority and subordination of order. The term eternal reinforces the fact that the generation is not merely economic, but essential. Thus, it does not imply a time when the Son was not, as Arianism argued, nor does his subordination imply inferiority. Hilary uh, Poitiers uh, writes, both the unborn Father is God and the only begotten Son of God is God. God is nevertheless one, and, and the subjection and the dignity of the Son are both taught in that by being called Son. Augustine, in his great work on the Trinity, has said this, that the Son is not just said to have been sent because the Word became flesh, but that he was sent in order for the Word to become flesh. 
For he was not sent in virtue of some disparity of power or substance or anything in him that was not equal to the Father, but in virtue of the Son being from the Father, not the Father being from the Son. Anselm, if the Father is numerically the same thing as and not distinct from the Son, it is not true that something should be affirmed of the Son and denied of the Father, or affirmed of the Father and denied of the Son. But, he says, such reasoning, if it is approved, is really the heresy of Sibelius, modalism. Thomas Aquinas, as the Father is not from another, it is in no way fitting for him to be sent, but only for the Son and the Holy Spirit. John Calvin, to the Father is attributed the beginning of activity and the fountain and wellspring of all things. The observance of an order is not meaningless or superfluous when the Father is thought of first, then from him the Son, and finally from uh, uh, from both the, ho the Holy Spirit. Charles Hodge, a great Princetonian theologian, the Nicene Doctrine includes the principle of the subordination of the Son to the Father and the Spirit to the Father and the Son, but this subordination does not imply inferiority. Augustus Strong, Baptist theologian, the subordination of the person of the Son to the person of the Father to be officially first, the Son second, the Spirit third, is perfectly consistent with equality. Priority is not necessarily superiority. Uh, Louis Burkhoff, uh, this subordination of the Son and of the Spirit to the Father and the Son is not in any way inconsistent with true equality. Generation and procession take place within the divine being and imply a certain subordination as to the manner of personal subsistence, but not subordination as far as the possession of the divine essence is concerned. This ontological trinity and its inherent order is the metaphysical basis of the economic trinity. Philip Schaff, surely one of the greatest uh, church historians of the 19th century and uh, editor of the Nicene, post-Nicene Fathers, wrote this, the Nicene Fathers still teach, like their predecessors, a certain subordinationism, which seems to conflict with the doctrine of consubstantiality, but we must distinguish between a subordinationism of essence, usia, and a subordinationism of hypostasis, a person of order and dignity. The former was denied, the latter affirmed, says Schaff. Francis Hall, uh, an early 20th century Episcopalian theologian, the two truths of subordination and co-inherence by their combination complete and guard the doctrines of tri-personality and divine unity. Very important statement. A.M. Hills, a Nazarene theologian, writes the scriptures in saying that the Father, Son, and Spirit possess the same attributes, say that they are the same in, in substance, but the scriptures no less plainly teach an order or rank or subordination existing between the different persons of the Trinity. Uh, William Pope, recognized, uh, a recognized 19th century Arminian theologian, writes, it cannot be denied that the best and purest teaching on the subject has laid emphasis on the mystery of the eternal subordination in the scriptural sense of the term, in the interior relations of the two persons of the Trinity to the first. P.T. Forsyth, a quotable uh, theologian, a Scottish congregationalist, has written uh, th that obedience to the Father demonstrates that subordination is not inferiority on the part of the Son, and it is, and it is godlike. The Father and the Son, the Father and Son is a relation inconceivable, he says, except the Son be obedient to the Father. Therefore, in the very nature of God, subordination implies no inferiority. Colin Gunton, passed away just a few years ago, very prominent Trinitarian theologian, has written, a subordination of taxes, of ordering within the divine life, divine life, but not one of deity or regard, it is as truly as divine to be the obedient self-giving son as it is to be the father who sends and the spirit who renews and perfects. Uh, John Frame, as many of us know at Reform Seminary, a fine evangelical theologian, writes, Biblical Trinitarianism denies ontological subordination but affirms economic subordination of various kinds. But there is a third kind of subordination that might be called eternal subordination of role. There is no subordination within the divine nature that is shared among the persons. The three are equally God. However, there is a subordination of role among the persons which constitutes part of the distinctiveness of each. And uh, finally, uh, J. Scott Horrell, who teaches at Dallas Seminary, he has a book coming out on the Trinity, 
He writes this, philosophic arguments that a true equality of nature necessitates ultimate equality of social order are neither rationally required nor harmonious with God's self-revelation. Conversely, to insist on equality of eternal roles and order in spite of biblical evidence is methodologically parallel to that of the heterodox, heterodox theologians who reduce God to their own mental paradigms. When philosophical reasoning divorces a theology of the imminent trinity from the revelation of the economic trinity, it may have journeyed to where we dare not go. Now, Roman numeral three, some theological implications from this scriptural support and historical confirmation. It is clear that everything in scripture on this subject indicates the submission of the Son to the Father in eternity past, in the incarnation, and in the submission of the uh, of the Son to the Father uh, throughout all of eternity. And Dr. Grudem has given biblical evidence for that. Let me give three summary theological implications that we see coming from this. Number one, the only confidence that we have in knowing God is by his self-disclosure. We are dependent entirely on what he tells us of himself. And apart from this self-revelation, we could know nothing about God. Since the entirety of God's self-disclosure indicates an intrinsic authority and submission structure in the Trinity, how reasonable is it to conclude, contrary to all that God has revealed about himself, that God actually is, in his Trinitarian relations, completely different from everything his revelation has indicated? As Karl Barth and others have noted, if God is different in himself than he is in his revelation, then his revelation cannot be trusted to tell us who God is. Father, excuse me, further to call into question this connection between God as he, is, as he is revealed and God as he is in himself, where scripture does not lead us to make this distinction, would throw his people into a state of confusion and ultimate agnosticism about who God really is. To trust his revelation is to accept, among other teachings, the unbroken, uniform, and non-reciprocal role relations that scripture indicates are true of the persons of the Godhead. The only conclusion that scripture urges then is that the relations of authority and submission exist eternally among persons of the Godhead. Implication number two, we hold that the Son and the Spirit each possess eternally and fully the identically same divine nature as is possessed by the Father. Every attribute of deity possessed by the Father is possessed fully and equally by the Son and the Spirit, since all three possess fully and eternally the undivided divine essence. We also hold that Trinitarian persons possess distinctive properties relating to his personhood, properties possessed by only one divine person and not by either of the other persons of the Trinity. What this formulation of Trinitarian persons' full equality and the divine essence of, of the divine essence and distinctive properties of personhood does is succeed in preserving what orthodoxy insisted on from, from Nicaea onward. Namely, that in divine essence or nature, Father, Son, and Spirit are in every way identical. After all, there is one and only one God. But in person, there must be distinguishing properties of persons. After all, the Father is not the Son or Spirit. The Son is not the Father or Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father or Son. One might even say that the Father has certain distinguishing personal properties that are essential or necessary to his being the Father of the Son, but that in no case are these properties of his distinct personhood properties of the Father's divine essence or nature. The Son then is rightly distinguished in his personhood from the Father, but the Son cannot be distinguished in his essence from the Father." Distinguishing properties of, of each person's personhood then, while being essential to him as a divine person, are never properties also of that person's divine essence. Eternal equality of essence and eternal distinction of persons then are both upheld in this understanding, the twin pillars of all orthodox formulations of the Trinity. The role of the Father in directing and the Son, in sending the Son, and the Son in, in hearing and obeying his Father then are likewise eternal. Once again, the only conclusion that Scripture urges is that the relations of authority and submission exist eternally among the persons of the Godhead. Implication number three, 
If one were to dismiss the manifold scriptural indicators we've considered here and posit instead an ultimately egalitarian structure of the imminent trinity, one would not only have departed from every scriptural indicator, in addition, one is left without any clear means of distinguishing the Father, Son, and Spirit from one another. Perhaps one might resort to the classic orthodox formulation of Father is unbegotten, the Son is the begotten of the Father, and the Spirit as proceeding from the Father and the Son. Even here, though, there is a priority ascribed to the Father, in which case one must still ask whether this is eternal and absolute, that is necessary, or accidental and ad hoc, that is contingent. If eternal and necessary, a, rel a relationship eternally exists in which the Father has primacy in position and the Son and the Spirit are secondary in position in relation to the Father. Then all biblical indicators extend from this principle as the Father is supreme authority in the Trinity. But if ad hoc and contingent, one is back to the place in which no eternal and necessary distinction can be made of the three persons of the Godhead. What does it mean then for the Father to be Father or Son to be Son? Of whom are we speaking if these names and their respective roles and relationships are not themselves eternal and necessary? Does this not reduce to a nondescript form of modalism in which Father or Son or Spirit are merely contingent modes of expression of persons who are in every way identical to one another in their entire set of properties? And if identical as persons, then the law of the indiscernibility of identicals would require us to say that each of the persons of the Trinity is, that's an is of identity, is each other person of the Trinity, since nothing can be rightly cited which distinguishes one person from the others. Therefore, for the Father truly to be the Father, he must be the eternal Father of the Son. For the Son truly to be the Son, he must be the eternal Son of the Father. These eternal names identify each as distinct persons whose distinction must be accounted for. And I'll skip now to the concluding affirmations and denial. We affirm, number one, an equality of identity among the persons of the Trinity, the strongest form of equality that there is in principle. Hence, there exists a full and eternal equality among the three persons, of uh, each of whom possesses fully and eternally the identically same divine essence. Two, we affirm the Nicene-Constantinople Declaration that the Son is fully homoousius with the Father and hence is of the same nature as the Father. Number three, we affirm the eternal and absolute and non-reciprocal role relations among the three persons of the Godhead, with the Father as supreme in role, as highest in authority, the Son second and under the authority of the Father, and the Spirit third and under the authority of the Father and the Son. Since the one and undivided essence of the Father, Son, and Spirit is possessed fully, equally, and eternally by each of the three persons of the Godhead, the subordination of the Son to the Father and the Spirit to the Father and the Son is a subordination exclusively of role or function and in no wise is a subordination of nature or essence. Hence, we affirm that some properties that are distinct to each person are essential to their personal identities. We also affirm without conflict or contradiction that all persons properties true of the divine essence are possessed fully and eternally by each of the three divine persons without exception and without qualification. Four, and finally, we deny altogether as entirely misleading and fallacious the assertion that the Son's eternal submission to the Father entails a denial of the complete and eternal essential equality of the Son and the Father. Since the equality among the persons of the Trinity is their equality of essence, in which each possesses fully and eternally the identically same divine nature, but the subordination within the Trinity relates exclusively to roles and relations that subsist among those persons, it follows that the affirmations of eternal functional subordination is fully compatible with and in no way contradicts the full equality of essence of the Trinitarian persons and the homoousius of the Son with the Father. Therefore, we affirm from the entirety of relevant scriptural teaching and clear and compelling reason that relations of authority and submission exist, exist eternally uh, and among the essentially equal persons of the Godhead. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be praised. Thank you very much. Well done on time. We're going to go for 30 uh, more minutes for group number two here.
Well, good evening to all of you. Um, it's really an honor to be here with you guys tonight. Um, Dr. Grudem, I was just looking at a theological topic last week and consulted your text with, um, with benefit. So thank you for being here. It's good to be with all of you tonight. I must say, I really am surprised to have this many people here. Um, my son, Josiah, who's six, said, Dad, you're going to be in debate? Said, yeah. He said, I'll just stay and watch it on TV. I said, no. <laughs> Not that kind of debate. Um, all right. No lipstick, pit bulls, nothing like that up here tonight, okay? All right. We're going to make two main arguments here tonight. First, that there are no good reasons, contrary to the impressive statements we just heard, on closer examination, there are no good reasons to hold to the position advocated by doctors Ware and Grudem. Second, there are very good reasons for Orthodox Christians to reject their account. But first, let me make some clarifications. First, let me just say what this debate is not about, just so we're clear about this. It's not about biblical authority. All of us who are involved in this debate hold to the full and final authority of Scripture. Bruce Ware, Wayne Grudem, Keith Yandel, and I were in full and hearty agreement about the authority of Scripture. Just to be clear, this debate is not either about philosophical theology versus biblical theology. Mm -hmm. Just as all of us up here accept the authority of Scripture, so also both sides of this question employ terms and concepts that are drawn from philosophy. You've heard that tonight. Doctors Waring Grudem, as well as Dr. Yandel and I, refer to essence, to being, to substance, to person. Both sides draw distinctions between ontology or being on the one hand and function or economy on the other. We all use these terms and concepts, and I'm pretty sure we do so not only out of deference to tradition, but also because we think this is the way it probably should be done. In fact, I don't think we could even make much sense of their position without a distinction between essence and role. So this debate is not about philosophy versus the Bible, nor can it properly be adjudicated by just quoting the most text. Any of us could produce a long list of biblical texts that say the Son submits to the Father, or a long list of texts that say that the Son is um, equal to the Father. The important questions here are not who quotes the most verses, but how are these verses to be interpreted theologically? And I'm sure we all agree on that. Now the question is, do they actually support the theological considerations in question? Do they th really support the full theological conclusion? Do they move us all the way there? Are these passages properly interpreted? Do they support the view in question? And on the other hand, are they really important, and I think we all agree these are really important, really important ontological claims being made? Are they adequately understood? And are they actually defensible? So, back to our task. First, there are no good reasons to accept their view. Dr. Grudem seems to think that the very identity of the persons is at stake here. He says that authority and submission between the Father and the Son and between Father and Son and Spirit is a fundamental difference, or probably the fundamental difference, between the persons of the Trinity. Otherwise, he says we'd only have person A and person A and person, person A, person B, and person C. Thus, the personal relationships themselves require the subordination of the Son. We've heard him say that the very names Father and Son attest to the authority of the Father over the Son. He's also exercised especially to combat claims that there is mutual submission within the Trinity. He says that if the Father also submitted to the authority of the Son, it would destroy the Trinity because there would be no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but only person A, person A, and person A. Now, this is a really strong claim. But he explains it further by stating that the differences in authority among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the only interpersonal differences that the Bible indicates exist eternally among the members of the Godhead. These differences in which there is authority and submission to authority seem to be the means by which Father, Son, and Holy Spirit differ from one another and can be differentiated from one another. He says if we do not have economic subordination, then there is no inherent difference in the way the three persons relate to one another. And consequently, we don't have the three distinct persons existing as Father, Son, and Spirit for all eternity. Now, we might wonder why Dr. Grudem would make such a claim. Unless one begs the question here, that is assuming these personal distinctions and that, they, that the personal distinctions entail a authority relationship of hierarchy, and then arguing that since there are genuine distinctions, then obviously we have a hierarchical structure. But apart from that, it's not entirely clear what would motivate this kind of claim. But let's think about this. Maybe there's more here. He also says that if we do not have such differences in authority 
in the relationships among the members of the Trinity, we would not know of any differences at all. And it would be unclear whether there are any differences among the persons of the Trinity. But surely, barring theological anti-realism, the personal distinctions of the Trinity do not depend upon human recognition of them for their existence. It may be an interesting fact about us that we might not know much or maybe anything about the Trinity other than by the revelation we have. But such an admission says nothing about the nature of the triune God. Dr. Yandel is going to pick this up, so I'll let this go for now. Let's move to the heart of the case advanced by Drs. Grudem and Ware. As they said, they refer to many passages which speak to the temporal, the economic subordination of the Son. None of us disagree about that, so we'll just move on. They do, however, also argue that the Father is subordinate to the the Son is subordinate to the Father from eternity past to eternity future. So leaving aside for now exactly the question of what does it mean to talk about eternity past and eternity future, I think the arguments deserve a closer look. So let's look at what I take to be their two strongest arguments. Dr. Grudem argues that the Son is subordinate in eternity past, and he supports his claim by appealing to texts which speak of the Father sending the Son. He didn't spend quite as much time on that tonight. It is in the handout, and it is in his numerous writings on this topic. He concludes that the giving and sending of the Son, quote, implies a headship, a unique authority for the Father before the Son came to earth. Now, how this sending implies authority and subordination is less than clear to me. But I take it this argument moves along these lines. One, if one divine person sends another, then the divine person sent is eternally and necessarily subordinate to the divine person sending. Two, the Son is sent by the Father. Three, therefore, the Son is eternally and necessarily subordinate to the Father. This is, of course, exactly their conclusion. So far, so good. Except when we stop to look at number one. Reason to believe in number one is less than obvious. It's not self-evident, nor have we been presented with any evidence for it. But let's think of something further. If this argument works for them, it's going to work too well. For consider again, one, if one divine person sends another, the divine person sent is eternally and necessarily subordinate to the divine person sending. Two, biblical witness also speaks to the Spirit being sent by the Son. Or five, therefore the Spirit is eternally and necessarily subordinate to the Son. Now again, I think this fits their um, approach very well, and I'm sure this is acceptable to them. But consider further. Again, one, if one per divine person sends another, the divine person sent is necessarily and eternally subordinate to the divine person sending. But consider six, the Son is sent by the Spirit, of which we have ample evidence in the Gospels. Seven, therefore the Son is eternally and necessarily subordinate to the Spirit. But surely seven would not be a conclusion they would want to accept. If Dr. Grudem's argument succeeds, which isn't quite obvious to me, then it succeeds in either showing an outright contradiction between five and seven, or in demonstrating maybe that there's mutual submission within the Trinity. Or consider the argument that the Son is subordinate to the Father in eternity future. There's one passage which they pointed us to, which does seem to speak about the Son being subordinate to the Father in the eschaton. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 28, as we saw. Grudem comments that in this passage, Scripture shows us that the beginning of the eternal state with the Son is where he is subject to the Father. He says, unless there's strong evidence in Scripture showing a, a change in that situation, which there isn't, the passage leads us to think this situation will continue for eternity. So prior to the foundation, the Son's subject. In the incarnation, the Son's subject. After the incarnation, today, he's subject. It's always been that way, and it will be that way forever. But let's look at this more carefully. I think on closer inspection, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 underdetermines the issue. So far as I can see, it doesn't tell us that the Son is permanently subordinate, much less that he's necessarily subordinate. What is clear is that the Son will be subject after the last enemy is destroyed. If we take will be subjected to imply some kind of role or functional subordination, then we, can, can, then we can conclude that this will continue at least for some time. Now, as Grudem recognizes, just how long this will continue is not explicit in Scripture. But that's really beside the point. In no way does this imply that this submission or subordination is timelessly eternal or backwardly everlasting. More importantly, however... This passage gets us nowhere close to the conclusion that the Son's subordination is necessary. It tells us of what is and of what will be. It does not tell us of what must be. 
It doesn't tell us the Son is necessarily subordinate. There's another way of reading this passage, several other ways. One of those is with the broad Christian tradition, and that is that we are to affirm the subordination of the Son, not, accord, not to the Son's simpliciter, but to the person of the Son according to his human nature. So as his incarnation continues, so we shouldn't be surprised if he continues to intercede to us for the Father. Now, if these indeed are the strongest of the arguments for their view, and I take it that they are, then from this analysis, I think we can safely conclude that so far we haven't seen good reasons to accept their view. On the other hand, there are really good reasons to hold their proposal at arm's length. And to these we now turn. I am very glad to be here this evening. And since this is sponsored by the Carl Henry Center, I want to be allowed just a moment to talk about Carl Henry. When I was an undergraduate and an MA student at Wayne State University, I read Christianity Today faithfully. It was part of my intellectual lifeblood. It was that quality and kind of magazine because Carl Henry was the editor. The most influential book I read as an undergraduate was a book called Remaking the Modern Mind by Carl Henry. I am very grateful that I got the chance to meet Carl, to become his friend, to enjoy his fellowship. If I have an intellectual father, it is Carl Henry. Now, whether that is praise or blame, <laughs> you will have to decide yourself. My colleagues, Dr. Grudman Ware, embrace what we can properly call role subordinationism. Hereafter, to save time, RS, which claims the son is permanently subordinate to the father, and the father is permanently authoritative over the son. If God is eternal, having no temporal properties, being outside of time, then the son is eternally subordinate to the father. If God is everlasting, without beginning or end, being forever in time, then the son is everlastingly subordinate to the father. What I say tonight will apply equally to either view of God and time. Now, if RS is true, there are only two versions of it that are logically possible. Either RS is a non-necessary truth, that is, it in fact true, but it might not have been, or it's a necessary truth. That is to say, it could not possibly have been false. Those are the only two logically possible alternatives. Each version of RS faces enormous difficulties. But it's important to keep in mind which version we're talking about. So now I have my first two points. My colleagues hold that RS. The son is permanently subordinate to the father. Two, if RS is true, it's either necessarily true, could not possibly be false, or it's not necessarily true. It's true, but under some possible condition, it would be false. Now, among the reasons why my colleagues hold this is plainly a philosophical doctrine that cannot with any plausibility be viewed as the exegesis of any biblical text. I was interested to find Dr. Ware refer to the uh, principle of the indiscernibility of identicals. If I have time, I'll get back to that. So anyway, here's a quotation from page 251 of Dr. Grubin's Systematic Theology. It's from chapter 14, God in Three Persons, the Trinity, which contains much with which I agree. Here's the crucial sentence. The only distinction between the member and the Trinity are the ways they relate to each other and to the rest of creation. If we do not have economic subordinationism, then there is no inherent difference in the way that these three persons relate to one another. And consequently, we do not have three persons. Now, as you know, in this sense, economic relations are relations had in relation to God's actions in the world. Thus, this passage seems to say that there are not three distinct persons, unless God creates a world in which to act. Now, though it was said again tonight, so I'm not sure about this, I take it that what was that that's what was called a slip of the pen, 
back in the days when we did use pens. In other places, cited by Dr. McCall, I see no such suggestion, and I'll take RS3 expressed in one and two, in which no reference to economic matters are made. I mean, if God is distinct only if God creates the world, God's in very deep trouble prior to creation, and since he doesn't exist in order to create, he's in very deep trouble indeed. It can't be the case that inter-Trinitarian relations depend on economic relations, on relations, that is to say, between the members of the Trinity that have to do with the incarnation and redemption. So we get to the third point. There's no claim this is part of a biblical passage or the exegesis of a biblical passage, and it plainly isn't. Metaphysical doctrine one. The Trinitarian persons are distinct from one another only in virtue of there being relations of subordination and authority that hold among them. This is a claim about the possible conditions of numerical distinction between members of a certain kind, namely Trinitarian persons. Claims of that sort are paradigm cases of metaphysical claims. It's also a theological claim. A claim does not have to belong to only one type. The most one could claim with any plausibility is that metaphysical doctrine one is presupposed by some biblical passage. Now, if this is true, then what the passage said, and if what the passage says is false, then critics of Christianity have missed a way of arguing against what the Bible says by not arguing against MDI. And biblical exegetes of the passage in question, very likely, I haven't read them all, very likely have been remiss in not pointing out that MD1 must be true if what one, one or more biblical texts say is true. Here we have my points three and four. MDI is an important part of the reason given for accepting RS. And MDI is a metaphysical claim that is not the correct exegesis of any biblical passage. Point four. MD1 is an important part of the reason offered for accepting RS. And MD1 is a, metaf a metaphysical claim, and that's a philosophical claim, so an important part of the defense of RS is a philosophical defense. I cannot resist commenting parenthetically that I can't imagine that a refutation of MD1 uh, would in fact show that a biblical passage was wrong or that Christianity was false. But that's entailed by the position. Let me make clear that points three and four, like points one and two, are not criticisms for us. They are facts about RS. They're relevant to what's to come. Something interesting follows from metaphysical doctrine one that would be easy to overlook. It entails metaphysical doctrine two. The Trinitarian persons are distinct from one another only in virtue of relations that hold among them. The Christian doctrine holds that lots of relations hold between the persons of the Trinity. Mutual love and knowledge, for example. So even if the Trinitarian persons differ only in terms of their relations, those relations need not be relations of subordination and authority. Put it formally, while MD1 entails MD2, MD2 does not entail MD1. And it's hard indeed to see why, even if it must be only in terms of relations that the Trinitarian persons differ, that those relations must be of the kind that are us favorites. So now we have my fifth point. Even if Trinitarian persons are distinct from one another, only in virtue of relations that hold between them, it does not follow that those relations include subordination and authority. The relations could be relations that have nothing to do with authority and subordination. Looked at in one perfectly legitimate way, relations come in two brands, productive and pre presupposition. Productive relations produce a distinction between their relata, between the items they relate. Presuppositional relations presuppose, but do not produce a difference between their relata. Human parenthood produces a relation between its relata because it produces one of the relata. Being six inches taller than presupposes a distinction between its relata. Now it's easy to miss the distinction because if A and B are in some relation R to one another, it follows that they're different, whichever sort of relation R is. But this entailment is present for different reasons in the two cases. That my children were related to me by parents Parentage explains the difference between me and them, because it produces the difference. 
If A is six inches taller than B, that entails that A is not identical to B, because A is taller than B presupposes a difference that it does not explain. This relates to another point that matters here. Recent work by Richard Baucom has stressed the identity of God. While I think the work is first class, it's irrelevant to our topic tonight. What Baucom means by the identity of God is action descriptions that are true of God. That God called Abraham, gave the law to Moses, that God sent the prophets. No doubt these actions manifest the nature of God, but they do not constitute the nature of God since God would still be God had God not freely and graciously done these things. The identity of God in Baucom's sense has to do with our correctly identifying God. It does not have to do with the metaphysical identity conditions of God, with what it is in virtue of which God is God, which is our concern tonight. What RS in either version needs then is some metaphysical identity conditions of God that produ produces rather than presupposes a difference between the Trinitarian persons. This, R.S. says, is and can only be a hierarchy of authority and subordination. But notice what sort of relation being authoritative over and being subordinate to is. It's a presuppositional relation, not a productive relationship. There's a fatal defect in both MD1 and MD2. For any A and B, if A and B can be in some presuppositional relation to one another, that's only because they're distinct in some way, such that the being distinct in that way is presupposed by the claim they have that relation. The distinctness that is supposedly explained is in fact simply presupposed. So we have point six. RS proposes an account of what it is in the Trinity that is the basis for the distinction between persons. But in the way in which it does this, by reference to presuppositional relations, it simply assumes that which it allegedly explains. That's true for both RS considered as a supposed non-necessary truth and considered as a necessary truth. Suppose that RS is proposed as a necessary truth. Then consider the claim that the Son is permanently promoted to the Father. For RS is a non-necessary truth, this need not have been so. The Son might never have been subordinate to the Father. There are possible conditions that may or may not arise in which the Son is not subordinate to the Father. This gives rise to a kind of a line of thinking that my colleagues may not have considered. If RS is not necessarily true, then there are more versions of role subordinationism that first meet the eye. Here are four. The Father is permanently subordinate to the Son. The Son is permanently subordinate to the Holy Spirit. The Father and Son are permanently subordinate to the Holy Spirit. The Son is permanently subordinate to the Holy Spirit. There are, of course, other possibilities that involve two-tier subordination. C is subordinate to B, who is in turn subordinate to A. This is natural, given RS, since having two persons of the Trinity on the same level of authority would, according to RS, go counter to their numerical distinction. Suppose God were to have decided to always make it the case that the angel Gabriel exists. Then Gabriel will be permanently subordinate to God, and that won't involve a contradiction, since it's not a necessary truth that Gabriel exists, it's not a necessary truth that Gabriel depends on God. B is permanently subordinate to A does not entail. It's a necessary truth that B is subordinate to A. Anyway, the three-tier relation seems to be what supporters of RIS have in mind. A two-tier trinity. Father over son, son over spirit. The point is that if RS is true but a non-necessary truth, each of RS1 through RS4 is logically possible. Each could be the case. Authority rankings in the Trinity might change, or at least they might have been quite different from what they are. All this follows if RS is true, but not a necessary truth. In fact, an omnipotent being could make any of RS1 through RS4 true, or change the authority of subordination relations at will. 
Now, it would be fair to ask why I even raise the possibility of RS being a non-necessary truth. Given that Dr. McCall has already quoted from Dr. Gruden's writings, that he takes RS to be a necessary truth. My reply is there are two colleagues who embrace RS, and there's a wrinkle here that complicates matters considerably. Consider this passage from page 97 of Dr. Ware's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son is shown to be under the Father, but over the Spirit. Although the Son is under the Spirit in the Incarnation, in his exaltation the Son returns to his place under the Father, yet over the Spirit. So it turns out that in Dr. Ware's view, expressed in writing, the authority subordination role of the Son and the Holy Spirit is not necessary. During the period of the incarnation of the Son, it was reversed. The Son was subordinate to the Holy Spirit for reasons concerning our redemption, in the usual jargon, for economic reasons. The switch in authority to subordination lasted, in Dr. Ware's view, apparently something like 30 to 33 years. But it's not permanent, and so it's not necessary. So we have at least one of my colleagues committed in writing to this view, which is my point seven. At least one proponent of RS claims that the authority of subordination relations that hold between two Trinitarian persons are not necessary after all. Further, the, just the justification offered for the view expressed by the passage from Dr. Ware's book is based on a biblical passage. The closest then that Dr. Ware can come to RS being a necessary truth is this that the Son is subordinate to the Father is permanent because it is necessarily true, but the subordination of the Holy Spirit to the Son is not permanent, and so is at best a non-necessary truth. That brings us to point eight. If the authority subordination relation of the Son and the Holy Spirit is reversed by, and so dependent on, the fact that the Son being incarnate why can't, and indeed, why isn't the subordination of the Son dependent on the Son being incarnate? Happens one time, why not twice? This entails that at least the Son and Holy Spirit are in time. More to the current purpose, it entails that the authority subordination relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit is not one of necessary subordination of one to the other. Necessities do not allow exceptions. I think it's fair to say, though I won't put much emphasis on it, that it's a strange view of the Trinity, on which one authority subordination relation is permanent and another is not, because one is affected by the incarnation and the other is not. If RS is not necessarily true, true but could have been false, an omnipotent God can make some other variety of rules of subordination to be true. Uh, I've got three minutes, so. Let's turn to point nine. If RS is presented as a non-necessary truth, each of these other versions of RS, RS one to four, which are possibly obtaining conditions, could hold. Now we're guess that a version of RS that entails all these other versions of RS could have been true. It's not one that warmed the hearts of a supporter of RS, but I'm not the one to decide that. Note one further thing about RS. If RS is held to be a non-necessary truth, to be true but it could have been false, there's another problem. Remember that for RS as well as its deniers, each Trinitarian person shares the same nature. I take this to mean there are certain properties that are necessary and sufficient for their owner to be God. Strong candidates for these properties include being omnipotent, being omniscient, being perfectly good, being holy, being loving, and the like. Each of the Trinitarian persons has these properties. The Father's being omniscient and the Son's being omniscient is not to be thought of along the lines of sharing a pie. The Father has a piece of omniscience and the Son has a piece too. The Father's omniscience is the Father's omniscience, the, Son, the Son's omniscience is the Son's, and the Holy Spirit's is the Holy Spirit's. The same holds for every other property among those possession of which is necessary and sufficient being God. It follows that there's nothing in divine nature that makes subordination relationships or authoritative relationships anything other than arbitrary. Being of the same nature makes it impossible to somehow it'd be appropriate that any Trinitarian person is subordinate to or authoritative over any other. 
Point 10. If the Trinitarian persons all equally meet the necessary and sufficient conditions of being God, then any subordination or authoritarian relations among them that is not freely chosen for some temporary purpose is arbitrary in the light of their being equally God. And that point applies both to RS as a necessary truth and a non-necessary truth. Finally, there remains the view that RS should be thought of as a necessary truth. It's something that could not possibly have been false. That's not freely chosen by the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit or by any combination of Trinitarian persons for any reason. The arbitrariness of the arrangement remains in full force here. But other problems arise. On this understanding of RS, it is necessarily true that the Father is authoritative over the Son and the Son is subordinate to the Father. This raises a deep problem that can be put as follows. There are existence entailed properties, properties such that anything that exists must have them, being self-identical, for example. But since everything that exists, that exists is self-identical, that property cannot be the basis of something belonging to a kind. Beyond the existence entailed properties, the properties a thing necessarily has are part of the nature of that item. So if RS is presented as a necessary truth, it entails that the father has an essential property, being authoritative over the son, and of course the son lacks this property. The son has as an essential property, being subordinate to the father, and of course the father lacks that property. So the father has an essential property, a property that's part of the father's nature, that the son does not have as part of the son's nature. And the son has an essential property, a property that's not part of the son's nature. And that entails simply that the father and the son don't have the same nature after all. But that, I simply point out, entails ontological subordinationism. If RS is necessarily true, then it follows that ontological subordination is true. And that both of my colleagues reject. statements now from both sides. We're going to move to the 10-minute rebuttal round. Doctors uh, Rudin and Ware have 10 minutes to respond. Thank you, both of you, for stimulating presentations. You argue that uh, the Holy Spirit was subject to the Son while on Earth, and this shows the reversibility of authority within the Trinity. Um, our response to that is to say we agree that Jesus was guided by the Holy Spirit while on earth um, in part of this fulfillment of our, his role as being an example for us as believers. In fact, he wasn't only subject to the Holy Spirit while on earth. Luke 2.51 says he returned to Nazareth and was submissive to his parents. He was subject to his parents. And uh, John 19.11 says, he was subject to Pontius Pilate. You would have no authority over me except it had been given you from above. In fact, more than that, if we want to use incarnational events to deny aspects of the deity of Christ, we could say that Jesus was hungry and thirsty and weary as well. Therefore, he's not omnipotent. Of course, the point is that all of those things were part of Jesus' role as a man, obeying in our place, being guided by the Holy Spirit as a man, and our example, ultimately dying in our place. But while he was hungry and weak, he was still the omnipotent Lord who ruled the winds and the waves, and with a word raised Lazarus from the dead. Things that are true of Jesus' incarnate life on earth are not necessarily true of his divine nature. That's the very reason professors McCall and Yandel want to argue that the time of Jesus' earthly ministry does not prove our case of eternal submission. We agree with them that those events of Jesus' earthly ministry do not necessarily demonstrate eternal truths about his deity, and that's why we use Jesus' incarnational ministry on earth not to prove by itself eternal subordination, but to show it's one congruent part of a broad pattern that points in the same direction from eternity past to eternity future. The submission of the man Jesus to the Holy Spirit or his parents or the government does not demonstrate that Jesus' eternal divine nature was ever subject to the Holy Spirit. Second, Professor Gandel uh, quotes what he calls a slip of the pen. 
um, in my systematic theology book. And when I read this on the airplane and then uh, read it, I thought, you know, I, I think there's more than one slip of pen here. <laughs> First, I do not say if we do not have economic subordinationism, and there's no inherent difference in the way the three persons relate to one another, because I distinguish in the very footnote on that word, I say, I say if we do not have economic subordination, not subordinationism, and I probably this <laughs> page. It, it, it says economic subordination should be carefully distinguished from the era of subordinationism. But, um, Pete, a slip of your pen is matched by a slip of my pen, or Zondervan's pen, because um, in the statement where uh, I say um, uh, that the, the, the only distinction between the members of the Trinity are the ways they relate to each other and to the rest of creation, I read that on the airplane and I said, no. In 1994, when the book came out, I was in the Aldean building teaching a theology course from this book, and immediately students said, between each other and the rest of creation? I don't know where that wording came from. I immediately wrote Zondervan and said, please do, do remove rest of from before creation, as if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were part of creation, and they did. But now they've reformatted it and put it out again, and like the Terminator, the rest of is coming back into the book again, and I read Zondervan again, and I hope it all right. So, but, but to get to substance here, yeah, it, um, let, let, let me, um, uh, if we have no economic subordination, we have no differences between persons. And Dr. Yandel rightly said, if, if you understand economic to be related to the world, then of course that means that the creation was necessary to the Trinity. I do not believe that. That is solved by my definition of economic, um, which two pages earlier was, that it has to do with the, the inter-Trinitarian relationship between, the create, between them and the creation and each other. And so I had understood economic simply to be relational, including inter-Trinitarian relations. And I think that uh, probably was not a good choice of words, but I don't believe the Trinity, uh, the, the creation is necessary for the Trinity, certainly not. And I think the context of the rest of what I said makes that true. Dr. Yandel said, the differences between persons need not be uh, relations of subordination and authority, just to have differences. And I agree, if, if, you, uh, if you want to postulate other differences that are not represented in Scripture, then of course they need not be uh, differences of authority and submission. But these are the only ones that are in Scripture. Do we presuppose these relations? No, we find them in Scripture. <coughs> Thank you very much. I, I wrote out nine responses. I have time to read three. <laughs> Dr. McCall says it is less than clear what might motivate the claim that differences among Trinitarian persons in which there is authority and submission to authority uh, seem to be the means by which the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit can be differentiated. Response, what might motivate this claim? Only the entirety of the biblical revelation from God about himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every single text of Scripture that relates to the question of the relationship of the Father and the Son teaches and exemplifies a relationship in which the Father has authority and the Son submits. One wonders what motivates their claim to set aside the entirety of this biblical testimony as irrelevant since the pervasive manner in which God has described his own Trinitarian relations is through the self-chosen language of authority and submission. Number two, evidence of the Father's authority over the Son in eternity past or eternity future tells us only of what was or is or will be, but not of what must be. So argued our, our opponents. Here's my reply. Let's be clear on this. All of God's revealed truth to us of himself has come in the economy of revelation. That is, all is given to his people in specific temporal, cultural settings, describing for the most part God's activities and claims of himself within this economy. Yet theologians have inferred from this economic revelation some truths about God which are thought to be necessary to who God is as God. Take the holiness of God, for example. The revelation of God's holiness 
comes in the economy of revelation, most often through specific instances manifesting his holiness. For example, Isaiah's vision of God in Isaiah 6. If we applied the same methodology on these attributes as McCall and Yandel have done to the question of an eternal authority structure within the Trinity, we would have to call into, a, into question the eternality and necessity of most, if not all, of the attributes which theology has considered essential to the nature of God. One might reason. What these texts tell us about God's holiness or love or justice or wisdom is what was, what is, and what will be, but never are we told that any of these must be. We submit that the revelation, that is Grudem and Ware, submit that the revelation of God's eternal relations within the Trinity are in the same category of regular patterns of God's revelation concerning himself. When God tells us over and over that he alone is holy and no evidence of scripture is deduced to the contrary, we conclude that God is by nature, that is by necessity, as an essential property, holy. Regarding the question of eternal authority structure in the Trinity, we have the same unbroken, unqualified revelation. As with other such divine revelation, we think it right to conclude that God is eternally, as he always and without exception declares himself to be. And my last uh, comment is this. McCall and Yandel argue that if the Father has a property unique to him and not true of the Son, and if the Son has a property unique to him and not true also of the Father, this entails that, quote, the Father and the Son do not share the same nature after all, end of quote, which in turn, quote, entails ontological subordinationism, end of quote. Reply. The magnitude of the charge here, nothing short of Arian heresy, is only matched by the magnitude of the oversight. From the beginning, properties of the one and undivided divine essence were distinguished from properties of each person's unique and distinct personhood. Otherwise, how might we distinguish Father from Son and Son from Spirit? If the Father does not have at least one property that distinguishes Him from the Son, a property of His personhood, since He does not and cannot have any property of His essence that is not also possessed by the Son, then how is He the Father and how is the Son the Son? Is this not implicit modalism? Furthermore, if one denies that any properties are person-specific, is not the naming of the Trinitarian persons, strictly speaking, arbitrary? Doesn't this call into question whether we can truly know God as He is, from God as He has revealed Himself? The agnosticism and implicit modalism show the folly of denying that there are distinguishing properties of personhood. And when we look at Scripture to inquire just what these distinguishing properties are, guess what we find? Authority and submission mark the relations that mark off the Father and the Son and the Son from the Spirit. Fidelity to Scripture leads to the conclusion that relations of authority and submission exist eternally among the persons of the Godhead. Well, to um, conclude that we are promoting some kind of agnosticism or modalism from our criticisms of their arguments, if it's not a cheap shot, it's a pretty moderately priced one, I think. Um, <laughs> so, um, so far we've heard a lot of verses quoted from Dr. Gruden and Dr. Ware, and this understandably looks really impressive, at least at first glance, understandably because we have all affirmed the other authority of Scripture. But when you look at these arguments from Scripture more closely, because the Arian controversies in the 4th century, if they teach us anything, they teach us that long list of verses which speak of the Son's subordination of the Father can be used to argue for all kinds of mistaken theological conclusions. So let's take a closer look again. They argue from Christ's earthly ministry, but we all agree that these are not even remotely at issue. So we all affirm this, and so there's no disagreement, we'll move on. We can quickly conclude the same from passages which speak to the um, authority and submission of the Son after the ascension of Christ. And we can do the same as well for those which speak of Christ's authority and subordination after the final judgment. Since the incarnation continues, I mean, it's not as if Jesus dropped off his humanity on the way out. Um, since the incarnation continues, it's reasonable to 
to conclude with the broad Christian tradition that any remaining subordination would be due to the continuing incarnation of the Son. This leaves us with arguments about what we know from prior to creation and from the names of Father and Son. From, in order, first from the work of God prior to creation and creation. Dr. Gruber would argue that because the Father planned this work eternally, he's eternally had authority over the Son and has, the Son is eternally been subordinate. Here two points are relevant. First, it's simply not obvious that the Son is, the, the Son is not afforded over creation. After all, Hebrews 1.10 is a passage where the Father calls the Son Lord, by title of authority, and says that the Son laid the foundations of the earth. The second point, I think, is also relevant. Even if it turns out that, that our, um, our friends here are correct at this point, this doesn't move us to a relationship of authority and subordination that's eternal, much less does it get us to one that's necessary. In other words, even when we grant their exegesis, their theological conclusions don't quite follow from it, at least so far as I can see, and that may be my problem. It looks to me like they move, and, and rather too quickly, from the Father planned this eternally to the Son and the Spirit didn't plan it. And more importantly, they move from the Father planned this eternally to the Father eternally, necessarily, has subordination over the Son, or authority over the Son. This brings us to the argument from the very names of Father and Son. Now, at first glance, I have to confess, this argument struck me as question begging in Celsus, but there's more to it, and that's not fair. They and here's why it's not fair, because they insist that in the biblical world, the names Father and Son would certainly apply the authority. And then they conclude that this gives a strong indication. Now, two, two other points. One's just an observation, and that is this, that I take it that they intend this as suggestive rather than demonstrative, but more importantly, this again moves rather too quickly. We do not generally, at least, think that it's either required or advisable to take everything that was meant in the biblical world by, say, a term like shepherd or king, and apply all those things to God. Nor should we do so here. To the contrary, we should refrain from doing so if there's a good reason to deny it. And in this case, I think there is. Um, Dr. Yandel has argued that role subordination, as, as they understand it, is either completely arbitrary, self-contradictory, or both. And neither of those are good options. Finally, let me make one observation, one further observation about this. That this argument, again, relies on MD1, which is a metaphysical doctrine, um, which isn't a bad thing, but it's a metaphysical doctrine which is flawed, which isn't a good thing. Now, quickly, let me mention, let me note something from the Christian tradition. They cite, gave a citation from Thomas Aquinas that it is in no way fitting for the Father to be sent. They are then conclude that only the Son could become incarnate. But if we look at the fuller discussion of Aquinas on this, I think we see that it's, it kind of goes the other way. Aquinas asks this question, whether each of the divine persons could have assumed human nature. Objection one, as he states, it is it would seem no other person could have, which is their view. But then in his said contra, he says, whatever the Son can do, so can the Father and the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, the power of the three persons would not be one. But the Son was able to become incarnate. Therefore, the Holy Spirit and the Father were able to become incarnate. And he goes on to say that, um, hence we must say that the Father or the Holy Spirit could have assumed flesh even as the Son. The rationale for this is pretty clear. You can think of it this way. One, if the Father cannot become incarnate and the Son can, then the Father cannot do something that is logically possible or logically possible for a morally perfect being or whatever. Two, if the Father cannot do something that is logically possible, then the Father is not omnipotent. Therefore, three, if the Father is not omnipotent and the Son is, then either the Father and the Son are not homo us. Or, omnipotence is not an essential divine attribute, and I don't think either of those would be good. Aquinas sees this and takes the other view. So they quote Aquinas this way, but when we look at Aquinas more carefully, he says we're not to understand the subordination of Christ as a creature simply, but only in his human nature. So also we're to understand that Christ is subject to the Father not simply, but in his human nature. And he says it's better to add this qualification in order to avoid the error of Arius who held the Son to be less than the Father. Let's just make one thing clear. I'm, I'm, I don't think either of us have charged anyone with Arianism or anything like that. I, I have no interest in that. That's not my job. It's not my business. What we do need to do as theologians is think together about the implications of our views. And there's a big difference between affirming A and denying B. On one hand, on the other hand, affirming A, denying B, and affirming C, which entails the denial of A and the affirmation of B. And that's our concern. <laughs> okay. Anyway. It's not just Aquinas 
no less an authority on medieval theology than Richard Cross, says that the medieval theologians, he actually says all the medieval theologians, hold that the Father or Spirit could be incarnate instead of, or as well as, Son. This is exactly the opposite position of the one uh, we're talking about here tonight. I will readily grant that some modern theologians, the ones they mentioned, and indeed they could add this, add to their list, Karl Barth or Karl Rahner, take a view similar to theirs. But Rahner forthrightly states that his view is a departure from the received tradition. I have never before been accused of being a modalist. <laughs> I suggest that's true for a simple reason. I'm not a modalist. <laughs> I take Dr. Gruden's point quite seriously about subordination. Apologize for using the word. And I ask you to do the following in your handout. When you reach subordination in that argument, remove the last three letters. And given that, I stick with the argument. Second, if a relation changes, for whatever reason, for however short a time, it is not a necessary relation. Third, the distinction apparently that's crucial for Drs. Ware and Bruder, and the difference between their two views on this is not been discussed, except if I might describe it. Uh, it, is that what we've got to do is distinguish between the personhood of the person and the divine nature. And I did not bring it up, but the identity, I'm sorry, the indiscernibility of identity was a building. Now, I know that principle. What it says is this. If A is identical to B, it then follows that every property that A has, B has, and conversely. Now, whether that's true or not depends on what you mean by property. Can there be two perfectly resembling things that are nonetheless qualitative to sin? Could, for example, God create two souls, each of which always has the, the thoughts that correspond to the others? To which my answer is yes. Now, I will not bore you or offend you, or offend against time in particular, by arguing that the version of the indiscernibility of identicals that's being appealed to is false. It uses the word property in a sense in which that statement is false. Now, there's a careful philosophical argument for that, which I won't try to give you now. Uh, let's look for just a moment at Calvin. Three passages. Uh, uh, let's look at the explanation in Greek, just for a moment. Such as the Father is, such as the Son, such as the Holy Spirit, none is a for or after another, none is greater or less than another. The whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal. Compare the second bunch of confession. Calvin, God is the head of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. According to that passage in Calvin, the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, page 229, Jesus is equal with the Father. The answer is, since Christ has made himself subject to the Father in our flesh, for apart from that being of one essence with the Father is equal with him. Let us bear in mind, therefore, that this is said about Christ the Mediator. My point is that he is inferior to the Father because he has clothed himself with our nature so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What is the higher rank of the Father to do? The incarnation of the Son for our redemption. My Father is greater than mine. He places the Father in the higher rank, seeing the bright perfection of splendor that appears in heaven differs from the measure of the glory which was seen when he was clothed in the flesh. Institutes 1, 13, 26. And finally, the nicest passage of all of our purposes, the one where uh, Christ hands the kingdom over to the, to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. I will read just part of the quotation. Until he comes forth as judge of the world, Christ will therefore reign. Joining us to the Father is the measure of our weakness permits. 
But when it partakers in heavenly glory, which was you died as he is, as he is Christ, having then discharged the office of mediator, then returns the Lordship to his Father, so that far from distinguishing, I'm sorry, far from diminishing his own majesty, it may shine all the more brightly. Then also God will cease to be the head of Christ, for Christ's own divinity will shine in himself. Okay, we're moving to the third phase. There's going to be five-minute responses uh, from each group. Five and a half. <laughs> Thanks. A question we really need to get resolved before the end of the meeting is, if God is not what he reveals himself to be in the Bible, then how can we know anything about God in himself? And this seems to me to be a question that uh, Dr. McCall and Dr. Yandel need to answer. When they're saying, well, admittedly, God is this way in the Bible, but he might not be this way. It's not a necessary truth. My response is that when we're dealing with an eternal, immutable God, then it is necessary, unless we say that God could be other than who he is. Well, then... What do we need the Bible for at all? We could make up anything we wanted to about God. So on your methodology, I want to ask, how can you know anything about God? Second, um, thanks for saying we're not Arians. I appreciate that. I've never been an Arian. I explicitly deny Arianism repeatedly. So do the creeds. So do the fathers of the church. As far as Sabellianism and modalism, no, we do not want to accuse you of that if that's not what you hold. But here's a way you could answer it. Um, Please tell us some eternal difference between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You look like you can, so I'll wait. <laughs> Finally, I want to say again, when all is said and done, what does all of Scripture say? From the Father predestining us in the Son before the foundation of the world, planning salvation before the, Father, before the foundation of the world, unto the Son being subject to him who subjected all things to him. The entire testimony of Scripture fits together. And then, massive, massive support for our position from the whole history of the church, going back to the Nicene Creed and on uh, through modern theologians. Those seem to me to be very significant arguments. Uh, just a, qu a few quick comments. Uh, first of all, I just want to set the record straight that uh, several paragraphs of Dr. Yandel's discussion of my statement in my book, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I think misunderstood me. And uh, since I'm the author, I guess I have the right to say that, uh, that I, I do not believe that there is a reciprocal uh, a reversal in role relations between the Son and the Spirit. Uh, I said just a little bit before the passage he quoted, I said this on page 95 of my book. Although Jesus submitted fully to the Spirit in his incarnate life, still the Spirit's eternal role is to uphold the will and the word of the Son. So I, I don't see that as a, as a, as a uh, reversible uh, relationship. In the incarnation, as Dr. Grudem said, of course he submits to the Spirit as the Messiah, as the son of David, as the seed of Abraham, and so on. Second comment on Aquinas. Yeah, I read, I read that lengthy discussion in Aquinas, and it is true. He does argue that on the basis of omnipotence that the Father could equally have become incarnate, the, the Spirit could equally have become incarnate. But then his next discussion, also lengthy, is how unfitting it would be for the Father or the Spirit to become incarnate in light of the incarnational mission. And so I think you have to put those together. Uh, and uh, so it depends on whether you mean in an absolute sense, was, was it impossible for the Father to become incarnate? No, but in a contingent sense, give, given the mission, given the purpose of the Son of the Father to be the firstborn among many brethren, and that all, all the mission that was involved, only the Son fit. Anselm, the long quote that you can see on page 12 of what I provided for you, uh, can, uh, can answer that as well. All right. Our 
piece of straw. Okay. <laughs> Can we have it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was strong now. Come on. Um, well, um, to this point, we've been arguing that there are no good re reasons to accept the RS position, and there are good reasons to reject it. Um, as I've said, um, I think that both Calvin and Aquinas, and we could multiply the sources again, um, take the other view. As far as the fittingness, it's one thing for it to be fitting from God's perspective. It's another thing for it to be fitting from ours, as in the Father and Son and Spirit. That's pretty tough for us on good days theologically. Um, how confusing would it have been if the Father would have become incarnate, so we'd have the Eternal Father as the incarnate Son. That would have been confusing. So it's a good thing we didn't have the Eternal Father, Son of Mary. That, that's how I think the fittingness should be understood. It's a significant concession, though, to admit that in contrast to the earlier views, that only the, Father, only the Son could become incarnate. Now we have Father and Son becoming incarnate. Let me say as well that we do affirm what Scripture teaches about God. What Scripture teaches about God is that the Son is subordinate and also teaches that the Son is equally and fully divine. If there are ways of understanding the subordination that call into question or contradict the fully divinity, then we need to look for another way of understanding the subordination. That's what we've argued here tonight. And that's the argument that Dr. Yandel has made. That's the argument, so far as I'm understanding, is still before us, has not yet been addressed. But there's a further reason, too, and it's a straightforward, explicit reason. Consider Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Here we read that the Father did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, we all agree that, I think, that this refers to what the Son did possess rather than seeking what he did not possess. We're faced with a question of what the Son surrendered in the act of becoming incarnate. Clearly, it has something to do with his equality. This does not mean that he gave up the divine essence. That would be impossible. It would both go against the text, the citation of Isaiah 45 in Philippians 2, but it would also be absurd. In other words, if he's essentially divine, which is, I take it, the only way to be divine, then he couldn't give that up. So what did he give up? Well, what we have in this passage, I think the most plausible, is he gave up equal authority. We see this from the phrase, he took on the very nature of a servant. That's in contrast to authority. If we take this as an instrumental participial phrase, then it is the means by which he emptied himself. So in becoming incarnate, he takes upon himself the form of a servant. And if we take the becoming here seriously as understanding of taking and emptying, then we're left with the conclusion that he became a servant via incarnation. You can only become something you're not already. This is further reinforced by the statement that he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death. As Millard Erickson points out, this suggests that that obedience was also something he acquired that was not present before. It is not death that he was obedient to, but someone else to whom he was obedient in the incarnation. And to death marks the extent of that obedience. The situation is similar with respect to Hebrews 5.8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. The adversative copier here is, although, suggests something extraordinary for the son, if though perhaps not novel. Again, we've been arguing that what we have are arguments in Scripture. We fully affirm these, that the son is subordinate. We also affirm that the father and son and spirit are fully and equally divine. If there are ways of reading the subordination passages which call into question and contradict and undermine the divinity passages then we better look for another way of understanding the subordination passages. I think there is another way, and I think, although we still disagree on these things, I think that's the broadly traditional way of understanding this, at least until you reach the 19th century. I have one minute. <laughs> I don't quarrel with Dr. Ware about what he intended to say. But when you say that Jesus was subordinate to the Holy Spirit during the time of the Incarnation, and he is eternally, the Spirit is eternally subordinate to the Son, which is permanent, you got a contradiction. And whether you got a contradiction or not is not dependent on whether you intended to contradict yourself. Now, the challenge is, give us an account philosophically of what makes one Trinitarian member different from another. Uh, which is a wonderful challenge, and I, I will do that in my course this semester. <laughs> I did it in my metaphysics course last time, but the basic idea is this. 
There is no reason whatever why an omnipotent God cannot create any number of things that are, in every relevant way, perfectly resembling. And furthermore, there is no reason why the fundamental distinction in the Trinity can't be between three, three bearers of properties such that the properties they have are distinct because they necessarily belong to what they belong to. And they be three individuals, three centers of consciousness, such that the existence of each depends on the existence of the, of the others, such that they have perfect awareness of one another, perfect love to one another. The, the issue is really one in, that's philosophical. It's about what the fundamental metaphysical identity condition can be. And as I say, said before, the indiscernibility of identicals is false read some ways and true read another way. And it's true if you read it in this way. One bearer of properties can, can be different from another bearer of properties, even if they have exactly twin properties. That's the bottom line. That's how they're distinct. All right, we have one more round of, I think you can have your minute if you like, six for you and five for them. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, I come back to my question. What about the entire testimony of Scripture? Does this tell us nothing about who God is in Himself? It's overwhelming. Our uh, friends here respond, well, God didn't have to be that way. It wasn't necessary. God could have created uh, Angel Gabriel, who would be always uh, subordinate to him, but that doesn't mean he had to, Gabriel, he had to create Gabriel in that way. My, my response is, of course, God didn't have to be this way if we postulate some other kind of God than who is in Scripture. But if the God that exists, the one true God, is the God who is revealed in Scripture, then he is this way. The Father eternally has authority over the Son. The history of the church massively bears witness to this consensus. And I come back to this other question. If God is not what we, what we read in Scripture, as according to uh, our opponent's methodology, they claim, how can we know anything about God for sure? How can we know he's holy? How can we know he's just? How can we know he's loving? All of that is revealed to us in the course of history. What we do have, in fact, with regard to authority and submission is something a bit more than God's actions in time. We have verses about before the foundation of the world, his eternal purpose, about uh, before all time or before all ages. Those get us back into the eternal counsels of the Trinity, and they point one direction, authority of Father over the Son. Dr. McCall says, if we hold to necessary subordination, this implies the Son is an inferior being. And my response is, the whole history of the church says that we have an eternal difference, called different things, but equality in deity, homo ousion. The early creeds called it eternal generation of the Son. That was just, a, may not be that most helpful way of talking about it, but it talked about a relational difference that never began. Philippians 2, did this mean that Jesus gave up authority when he came to earth? No, it means he gave up his status and glory. It says nothing about giving up authority. So, I come, so mm -hmm. how can you know anything about God? What about this entire testimony of Scripture? And finally, Dr. Yandel, well, what are the properties that distinguish Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? In theory, you say there might have been some properties. We have the ones that are in Scripture, that are testified in Scripture. But if you cannot specify properties and say there might be differences, it seems to me we are back not to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but to person A, person A, and person A. No eternal differences among the persons. And that surely is at variance with the doctrine of the Trinity as it has been taught throughout the history of the church. Uh, thank you all so much for your patience with us this evening and coming tonight. Thank you to the Hendry Center uh, for hosting this. It's been a great delight and privilege uh, to be with you this evening. Just a couple of uh, brief comments. Uh, again, I just want to go on record 
that in the sentence I wrote that Dr. Yandel quoted, he correctly indicated, this is on page six of the, of the handout you have, that I put the word returns in quotes. And I, indic I meant to indicate by that, obviously not a literal return. And if you read the context of what I said, there's no way you could draw that conclusion. So I do not believe in a reciprocity of, of uh, authority submission relationships of, of the Spirit and the Son. I do not understand the basis of the charge against us. I do not understand why an eternal function entails an eternal ontological difference. Someone explain to me, say, say the janitor of a corporation and the president of a corporation, the janitor is under the authority of the president. Now suppose that janitor is eternally a janitor, but he's a human being, and the president is eternally the president of that corporation, and he's a human being. Isn't the janitor still a human being and the president still a human being? Aren't they ontologically equal? So why is it that functional differences entail ontological differences, which I think is the basis of this charge? We rather see very clearly taught in Scripture that ontologically the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal because each of them possesses the identically same divine nature. The equality of the three persons of the Trinity is a, is a stronger equality than exists among us. Dr. McCall and I have the same kind of human nature. His human nature is the same kind of nature as I have, hence we are equally human. But we are two different natures. The, the, the equality in the Trinity is an equality of identity. The very same nature possessed by the Father is possessed by the Son, is possessed by the Spirit. A full equality of identity. You can't get stronger than that. And we, and we do not want in any way to diminish or, or undermine the full equality of the Father, Son, and Spirit. But we do wish to stand with the clear testimony of Scripture of everything that is said about the relationship of the Father and the Son, as has been demonstrated this evening, that there is an eternal role dif di differentiation uh, between the two of them, where the Father is the Father eternally, the Son is the Son eternally. And among the differences is authority and submission in the relational structure uh, between those two members of the Trinity. Thank you very much. It has been a delight to be here. I'm glad to be here too. <laughs> Let me put once more the argument. If the Son is necessarily subordinate, then he's essentially subordinate. If the Son is essentially subordinate and the Father is not, the Son is of a different essence than the Father. If the Father and Son are of different essences, then the Son has a different essence than the Father. And that denies the equal divinity of the members of the Trinity. Our S entails ontological subordinationism. Second, uh, we weren't the ones who brought up the indiscernibility of identicals. I'm happy to talk about it. We didn't bring it up. As I've said, in the version that, that doctors Ware and, and Gurdon require, the principle is false. And I briefly suggested why it's false. The question, again, which I answered once, how then can they be different? The bottom line in a proper metaphysic does not have the, the idea of a substance as the basic notion, the idea of a property as a basic notion. Its basic notion is a bearer of properties. And there can be two, in our case there are three, necessarily related bearers of the properties in virtue of which the bearer is fully and completely divine. It's a philosophical question about basic identity among different items. And obviously, I don't have time to argue for that. But that's the answer to the question. By the way, it's simply not the case that because we don't agree with the interpretation of Dr. Ware and Gurdam, that we do not accept scriptural authority, that we're trying to replace theology by philosophy or exegesis by theology. It's just not the case. 
I am not happy with the idea that what we do is reject biblical authority and replace it by philosophical authority. First, they're the ones that brought the philosophy up, not me. I'm perfectly happy to talk about it, it's my field. <laughs> and secondly, we respect the authority of scriptures in these matters as much as they do. We read those scriptures differently. Now, I have a suggestion to make in the end as term, in terms of biblical interpretation. B.B. Warfield, in an essay called The Necessity of Systematic Theology, wrote the following. The mind brings to every science something which, though included in the facts, is not derived from the facts considered by themselves alone as isolated facts. He's right. Let me slightly paraphrase. The mind brings in every, to, to every theology something which, though included in the text, is not derived from the text themselves alone as isolated texts. Athanasius wisely once said this. Now the scope and character of Holy Scripture is this. It contains a double account of the Savior. There is ever God and it's the Son, and that afterwards, for us, he took the flesh of a virgin. The scope is to be found throughout Scripture. There are two ways of reading the doctrine of the Trinity, at least. One, you take a metaphysical line that Jesus was begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father or the Father and the Son, whether, depending on whether you're East or West. The Bible says, Thou art my Son, this day I have begotten thee. That sounds like a reference to Bethlehem to me. One way of reading the scriptures on this matter is to do so be, through the lens of Greek philosophy. Begetting, Proceeding, these are metaphysical terms, and we read through the lens of those metaphysical terms the doctrines that have been discussed and the passages that have been quoted tonight. The other line is, for lack of a better term, the plain line. My temptation, of course, is to call it the biblical line, but I'll just call it the plain line. The plain line is that all the stuff about begetting is really best seen, maybe not historically what they meant, but it ought to be interpreted in terms of Bethlehem and the preceding interpreted in terms of Pentecost. That's when the Son was begotten, when Jesus was born or when Jesus was conceived. That's when the Holy Spirit was, was sent. That's when he preceded, pro, sorry, proceeded on Pentecost. Now, the difference we've got between Dr. Ware and Dr. Grudem on the one hand, and Dr. McCall and myself on the other hand, is they offer the first kind of reading, and we offer the second. It's a bit implausible then, it seems to me, to claim that we do not take Scripture seriously enough. What we're not doing is what we regard as reading the biblical text through the lens of Greek philosophy. Now, there are a lot of good things in Greek philosophy. Some of them you can baptize, but a lot of them you just can't baptize, no matter how hard you try. Uh, this is not an argument to authority, but it's an argument from respect. If you want to know what I would take the right approach to generation begetting to be, you want to look at a book you're familiar with. No one like him, John S. Feinberg, Pages 487 to 492. I have never seen an explanation of that notion of generation and a correction of the wrong notions of it written more clearly, more forcefully, and more carefully. That's my position, and I can't put it better than he does, and I haven't got time to read it. Okay, we're moving into the uh, 
question and answer phase. If you've got a question that's been, that's come to you that's in the back of your mind been bugging you, you want to ask it of someone, please uh, come to the microphones. I'm going to, while that, while that happens, you can, uh, I'm going to ask the first question, I guess, to get it going, and then we'll pass it along. Since uh, Dr. McCall didn't get a chance to speak, I've got a question that's come to mind. It's kind of a hypothetical question. If God had chosen not to create the world, would there be roles of authority and submission in the Godhead? Would the Son still be begotten? Would the Spirit still proceed? I guess that's a yes or no question. Well, um, there's actually several questions, but I can take a while. Do I get two minutes apiece on them then, or what's the... <laughs> All right. Um, what we have here is, the first question, at least, is what I'll go to. If, the, if Father, uh, Son, and Holy Spirit were not creating, well, if there are any... So well, do you mean this world or some possible world? This world. This world. Well... The answer is we don't know, because we're, had God created, say, uh, another possible world, one slightly different than ours, or one vastly different than ours, there still may be a role for subordination there. It's functional subordination. There's a function for that. Our real concern here is not, is the son subordinate? We, we all agree on that. The question is this, is the son subordinate necessarily? And on any tolerable account of essence, if the son is subordinate necessarily, then the son is subordinate essentially. If the Son is subordinate essentially and the Father is not, then they just aren't of the same essence. That's less than two. Can I say a word to that same question, please? <clears throat> if, the, if God had not created this world, would there be role differences of authority and submission to authority in the Trinity? Yes. Absolutely yes, because they have always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, let's start with the gentleman with the laptop. That looks heavy. <laughs> yep, there's a reason for this. This is a question that was emailed from Bellingham, Washington, someone watching live. His name's Phil Gans, and he's writing his dissertation on this, and this question's for you, Dr. Yandel. If the Son is necessarily the Son, and the Father is necessarily not the Son, then the Son is essentially the Son, and the Father is essentially not the Son. Thus, the Son is essentially different from the Father. You must deny homoousion on the basis of your premises. Respond, please. Uh, I, I lost the last sentence. <laughs> Thus, this, oh, you must deny homoousion on the basis of your own premises. Why? That's utterly baffling, why? <laughs> uh, why? We, we can tell you. Well, <laughs> I'm sure you can from the lens of Greek philosophy. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't pick up the argument. Please repeat it. The argument you offered me that I ought to deny homoousion. The son is essentially different from the father. Distinct from the father. But there was an if. There was an if to the sentence. My claim is that there is a fundamental difference between the three centers of consciousness the, even though each of them is omniscient, omnipotent, uh, morally perfect, each of them has every property that's necessary and sufficient for being divine. And what, what gives us unity? Well, the, none of them can exist without the others. There can't be a, a difference in will and purpose. When one engages in a project, the three engage in the project. Being omniscient, they're utterly aware of one another. Not just aware of what's true of one another, but aware of one another. And there's a much longer story, but that's the beginning of the story. What I'm denying is that the indiscernibility of identicals is true 
When you make the it, I, I'm denying it's true. When you make the basic categories here for philosophy, substance and property. Now, the, the temptation to call the Father's, the, the, the Trinity substance, it is very easy. God's an agent. Agents are substances. And the same thing goes for the persons of the Trinity. Each is an agent, so they're all substances. The problem is the concept of substance as it occurs in Greek thought, on which I will not give you a mini lecture, uh, will not allow both of those things to be said. The problem I have with analogies and metaphors about the Trinity is very simple. They don't work. God is unique. We need a concept other than the concept of substance. And I don't mean process, event, relations. We need a, a theological concept that is different from that of substance on the basis of which we can call God one and hold that there are three persons. And if you want it, I've, I've written a paper trying to explain that. I'll be happy to give it to you. It's good to uh, see Drs. Grudem and Weir again in, in the chapel. How's it going? Um, oh, I enjoy these two men immensely, even though I disagree with them theologically on certain points, and I have done so in their classrooms. The uh, questions that I've got for... Uh, but there's, there's two different questions, I guess. One is for uh, McCall and Yandel would be please answer the questions that the RS team has posited to you. That is, disagree with them on their exegesis. So they have put forward certain verses of which you haven't explained your side of the story. And the second one uh, to uh, uh, Weir and, and Grudem would be uh, the difference between um, function and appropriation. S function and appropriation. 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 Right. Appropriation. So how is the, the nature of subordination um, not an appropriation? Okay. Thank you. You ask us to address the exegetical issues. Well, they did raise, I counted um, 37 verses that were mentioned. And um, they rightly said that with respect to father-son language, they could have adduced hundreds more. Um, it's hard to deal with that in 10 minutes. Um, three basic categories in answer to your question. There are three basic categories, of their categories, of text. There are texts which speak to, e to the subordination in the economy of salvation, the 30 to 33 years. There are texts which speak to subordination eternity future. And there are texts which speak to subordination eternity past. With respect to subordination eternity present, or in the present, none of us disagree, so I don't think we need to address those. With respect to eternity future, well, there are a couple of different ways of doing that, but the most straightforward way is to go with the Christian tradition, say with Aquinas, and say, as the incarnation continues, so also it's not an unreasonable to ascribe continuing subordination to the person according to his human nature. Now, there are a lot of controversial things about the uh, communicatio idiomatum, and those are, I, I freely admit, complex issues. But that's what's at stake here. And if you take, the, I think, the right view of that, then you, you attribute in continuing, any continuing subordination, well, his incarnation continues. It's not like he dropped his humanity off going up. And so, of course, it's going to continue. Now, with respect to, to eternity past, as it were, I did address what I tried to address, what I took to be the strongest of those claims. Um, the sentness language, the Father sent the Son from eternity past, and I said, well, that argument relies upon a, a suppressed hit premise, uh, what I call premise one. If one divine person sends another, then the divine person sent is eternally and necessarily subordinate to the divine person sending. And I said two things. One is that that argument, if it works, is going to work too well because it either introduces a contradiction when we come to the Son and the Spirit sending one another, or um, we have another problem. That is, that we, well, not a problem for me, but a problem for them, that we have mutual submission within the Trinity, at least for 30 to 33 years. And if you got it then, it's not necessarily true that there's a ranked hierarchy. Necess necessities do not admit of exceptions. So, you know, no, I didn't deal with all of them, um, and I won't in another two minutes. Um, but I think we, we pretty 
readily can set aside two of those basic categories. The third, those are answerable. Their argument from sentence, again, probably proves something they don't want it to prove. On the other hand, actually rest upon a really implausible premise. That is their premise number one. They've got another question. Let me just make one quick comment to that question. And, and it simply is this, that I think we are not paying attention often to the, uh, the pronouns that are used in the New Testament in particular that specify one member of the Trinity over another. We tend to think generically of God. So, so in uh, Ephesians 1.9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. Who are the pronouns? Is it God? It's the Father, because, listen, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him. Aha! In Him, the Son. So the He's, all the He's that precede are the Father. The Father is the one who planned, who purposed, who willed, who decreed, who sent, all of these things in eternity past, done specifically by the Father. That's what the Bible says. So, you know, I, I just fi find it uh, an astonishing thing to think that we have the right to go contrary to what Scripture says of what the Father has done and, and not, not affirm that to be the case. Now, of the appropriations and, and uh, functions, I'm not quite sure, Jeff, what you are meaning by that, but I take... Uh, he, he never appropriates a function. He has the function by virtue of being the Son. Well, my economy, no, no, it isn't, because it's part, part of the imminent trinity. That is, Father, Son is imminent, not economic, first and foremost. Yes. Right. And so, again, my, my response is what we've said earlier is that everything indicates, in, in Scripture indicates that this was true in eternity past, Nothing conflicts with it. On what basis could we, could we rightly say this is not true of God eternally? And my, my point about what about the holiness of God? Show, show me a text that says he is necessarily holy. But what do we conclude? That indeed God is holy. So I think uh, the, the appropriation is, is exactly uh, what, what is right because he is the son, the eternal son of the eternal father. I'm sorry if this sounds like I'm just repeating myself, but I guess that's what I'm doing. Um, he, uh, Dr. Ware just said that we're not at liberty to uh, reject what Scripture teaches. I firmly agree. Um, what, what Scripture teaches about what God has done in this economy of creation and redemption, we fully agree. Okay, over on the left here. Uh, my first question is for Dr. McCall. Given the significance of John Calvin to our Christian tradition and as a biblical exegete, what is the significance of his understanding of the outer theos and of the doctrine of accommodation? And my second question is to Dr. Grudem. Which non-scriptural interpretive tool was most helpful to overcome the exegetical deadlock which took place in the debates regarding Arianism. Thank you. Regarding what? Arianism. Arianism. I guess I'm first again. Um, well, he asked a question about Calvin's doctrine of autotheos. And Calvin, I, as I read him, does affirm, contra Robert Raymond and others, um, I think Calvin does affirm eternal generation. But he also emphasizes this doctrine of autotheos to, uh, to affirm that the Son's divinity as such is not derived. He's God of himself, autotheos. Um, What non-scriptural interpretative tool was useful to overcome the exegetical impasse regarding Arianism? I don't think there was an exegetical impasse regarding Arianism. We fully affirm the, the complete equality in, uh, in being of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We completely affirm the full deity of the Holy Spirit. 
debate. Oh, the historical debate? Yes. Well, we go back to the fathers. I'll just say something about the Nicene Creed. Um, there, we, we have the Nicene Creed, uh, which says, uh, God of God, very God of very God, light of light, God of God, very God of very God, um, eternally begotten of the Father, begotten not made. And uh, it's uh, Aris participles, genethentes upoiethentes, having been begotten, not having been made. And they, they understand the only begotten verses in the Bible about God sending his only begotten son. They understand those to have something to do with a father-son-like relationship. And there was a lot of discussion about, is the father the the originator of the divine being of the son? Is the father the origin and the spirit? The father, the one who gives personhood to the son and the spirit. Calvin, I think, solved that and said, no, uh, we don't want to talk that way at all. So what do we have? We have generation and begetting and being begotten language they affirm a distinction in relationship. That was what Bromley, one of the great church historians, and Schaff said, those quotations. They say there is a, and that's what the church did. It said, we're not, we, they didn't define in any greater way what those relationships were, but they had something to do with a father-son-like relationship. Now, in the Appendix 6 to my systematic theology, and I agree that John Feinberg's book uh, as well says, they misunderstood the beginning language. It isn't having to do with genao, beget, bear. It's from genos, type or kind. And so uh, modern translations of the Bible don't even use the language only begetting, or most modern ones. They use, uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And so that's a unique sense, and it doesn't have to do with beginning. But, but the point is, the church never denied there was a difference in relationship. It's in all the creeds. And they use begetting and only begotten thing, language to talk about it. What uh, Dr. McCall and Dr. Yandel has given us is nothing to define the eternal difference in relationships. And that, I think, doesn't take account of the scriptural data. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. McCall, I uh, asked about accommodation in Calvin, together with the outer theos. We're going to, um, if you don't mind, we're trying to move through a number of questions. If you can limit yourselves to one question, I'd be greatly appreciative. If you're like me and you have life outside of Trinity, uh, we'll try to get us out of here by 9.30 if we can, okay? Which side are we on, actually? Over here to the right. Yeah, one question, primarily for Dr. Ware. Uh, in your last rebuttal, you were very strong on the eternality of these relations, and it seems that Dr. McCall and Yandel have been primarily focusing on the necessity. And I take necessity just to mean that it couldn't have been another way. So I guess my question is whether these relations are eternal or not, uh, that might be up in the air, but are they, are they necessary, meaning could they have been another way, or is this the way they had to be from all eternity time? If anyone else wants to jump in, that's fine as well. Could God be different than God is in any essential way that God is? I mean, could, could, could there be a different God? Yes, of course there could be a different God, but could this God, the true God, be different in, in any essential way but, and my but when, answer would be no. Hence, what is eternal is likewise necessary. But when they refer to um, the differences being essential, uh, you seem to be shaking your head vigorously saying no. That's... No, the problem with their, I mean, it's, it's a, a, an equivocation on the use of the word essential and essentially. So it, it, the argument goes something like this, as I understand it, that if the son has a, 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 prop, a property that distinguishes him from the father, it is essential to him as a person, and so he has a different essence. Than, but, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an essential property to his personhood. It's not an essential property to his essence and, and uh, his being. That, that is, so there's one, there's one being, one, one essence, one nature of God that is the common possession, the full possession undivided possession of each of the three persons of the Trinity. And so, and so we, we, we are affirming completely what is affirmed in all of the creeds concerning the oneness of God. And yet, there's got to be something that distinguishes Father, Son, and Spirit. There has to be. Uh, otherwise, what's the point of using these names? It's like saying uh, Bruce Ware and Jody's husband. Well, if you describe all the things about Bruce Ware and they're exactly the same as everything you say about Jody's husband, guess what? Bruce Ware is Jody's husband. 
I and that's true. I think so, so you have to have distinguishing properties of personhood. But I think Yandel's response is that even if you had identical twins that had the exact same properties, if they're two different persons, that's the difference. And so with the Trinity, even if they're identical triplets, so to speak. Of course, the analogy breaks down, doesn't it? Because you don't have identical twins with father and son. You have one common nature that is possessed fully and in an undivided way by both father and son. So I'm still waiting to hear what distinguishes father, son from spirit, besides names that seem to mean nothing. So what are the properties that are distinct from the father, that distinguish the father from the son? That's, honestly, that, that's what leads me to wonder how this is not modalism. I really don't know what more I can do to explain a basic issue in metaphysics. But it seems to be pretty clear, if I may say this gently, that my colleagues to my right have not followed or understood anything of what I've said about the indiscernibility of identicals. My claim, one more time, is not that the father and the son are twins or the triplets. My claim is that each of them is a distinct person what makes them distinct in a proper Christian metaphysic is that each is its own bearer of properties. Say that again. Each is its own bearer of properties. That's the bottom line in terms of individuation. And you can have perfectly resembling distinct bearers of properties. The assumption that Dr. Ware keeps making is that if you don't have property difference, then you don't have Difference. Uh, okay, let me try to put my point differently. Suppose there's the property being the father, and the property being the son, and the property being the Holy Spirit. These are necessarily properties that belong to the father, and the son, and the Holy Spirit. That is, being the father is a property of the father only, not of the son or the spirit. Being the son is property, that property of the father, not the property of the father or the Holy Spirit, but of the son. Being the Holy Spirit is a property that can belong only to the Holy Spirit, not to the father and the son. So if you want a property, then there it is. Now, that puts in different fashion the point I put in a different way. And since so it, it didn't communicate in a different way, maybe it will communicate in this way. But this is a philosophical claim. The claim is a certain reading of the inscrutability of identicals has got to be the right one, and if we don't assume it in our theology, we're, mo we're modalists. That's simply false. Why in the world think that Christian doctrine entails that particular reading of the inscrutability of identicals that was stated by Leibniz in discourse of, on the Discourse of Metaphysics, section nine, if I remember correctly. I simply don't think any of the biblical authors had foresight and had read the Discourse on Metaphysics. <laughs> okay. Um, let's ask one more question, see where it goes. Thank you. I'd like to hear um, Dr. Grudem's and Dr. Ware's thoughts on how the submission of the Son to the Father will be played out eschatologically after the plan of salvation is complete and intercession for the saints will have passed. Well, the Son is, I think, going to be eternally our great high priest representing us before the Father. Um, he is able to save for the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's, all of those are in the book of Hebrews. Um, he, and so uh, that's a hint of uh, that difference. And those multiple verses about sitting at the right hand of the Father also show that there is, there is a difference. There is ultimately now. What in the uh, unending, eternal future which no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor has the heart of man 
conceived, what, has, what God has prepared for those who love him, what will be the additional functional differences flowing from this eternal personal difference, not difference in being, what will be the, the eternal functional differences between the Father and the Son? I have to go back to Paul. What no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered in the heart of man, what God has prepared for those who love him. We don't know. What we do know is that he's eternally seated at the right hand of the Father, and that indicates that there's an ongoing difference in relationship. We don't know about what Scripture doesn't tell us about, so it doesn't fill in the details. Thank you. Thank you. John. Thank you. Uh, the last debate, I was the last question, and I got left out, so thank you, Chris. Um, my question is for Dr. Ware and Dr. Grudem. Um, you, your point has been that subordinationism is not uh, ontological. It is functional, correct? We don't use the word subordination. Well, the, the, the subordination is functional and not ontological. Yep. But you do say that this function is necessary. So how do you say an entity functions necessarily in a certain way without making an ontological claim? I would, if, if I say X has necessary function F, I would think that I am attributing a property to that X, and hence I'm making an ontological claim, not a functional claim. So if you could explain how saying the persons of the Trinity have necessary functions without the ontological ramifications of that, how, how is it not ontological if it's necessary? It is not ontological because all three persons share in the one undivided divine essence. So there is one being of God. In that being of God, there are distinctions of personal properties. Those do not involve a difference in the being of God, but in the relational component, the way they relate to each other. And the way they relate to each other is expressed to us in the terms father and son in scripture. So, uh, no, it doesn't mean there's any difference in being. It means there's a difference in relationship, and that difference in relationship is eternal because the one has been father and the other has been son and the other has been spirit eternally. So, um, but that's, that's the mystery of the Trinity. I mean, that's what the church has had for centuries, that there is a difference in role, but there is an equality in being, homoousios, and we affirm them both. Maybe one, one other way to uh, conceive of this is to distinguish between power and authority, which are sometimes in this debate confused or, or, or rendered synonymous. They are not synonymous by any means. So does the Son have equal power to the Father? Yes, He is omnipotent. You can't get more power than that. Does that mean that the Son uses His power to do anything that he chooses to do. No. He uses his power to fulfill the will of the Father, period. So he is under the authority of his Father in the use of all of the attributes that are commonly true of the Father and the Son. I apologize if you didn't get a chance to ask your question. Uh, you can, hopefully can do that. They be, have been gracious enough to stay an extra 25 minutes already. Um, I, I'm sure that they will stick around for a few minutes to talk with you. Uh, Dr. McCall and Yandel have um, one minute. They want to express their final thoughts, and uh, on, one of them at least is unrelated to the debate. Uh, I just want to say I'm sure we'll all, all join together in saying thank you. I'm so impressed, um, positively impressed with your patience and your tenacity and what is a really important but really sort of high-level, um, high-octane um, di discussion in some, in some ways. And thanks to you guys, too, for your patience when we go too long and when um, we're surprised by things and, and act startled in a startled way. So um, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Ware just said that there's a difference between power and authority. I think, that's, I think that um, we can, that's a good case to be made for that. I think on their view that what we see here is, oddly enough, that the sun 
is probably the one who's omnipotent. And the Father is the one with the, with the authority. Why? Because if only the Son can become incarnate, then the Father cannot become incarnate. That means the Father cannot perform an action, cannot do something that is logically possible and logically possible for a morally perfect being to do. Well, if he can't do something that's logically possible for a morally perfect being to do, he's most likely not omnipotent. Um, so if there is a distinction, it's probably, on their count, it's probably going to play out as the Father is the one who has authority, the Son's the one who's omnipotent. Um, anyway, thank you so much um, for all this. <laughs> Uh, I, I've been given the last comment. I promise not to make it part of the debate. Part of what I want to say is what Tom said in, in terms of your patience and your participation. I teach at a different kind of place. I did live in a different sort of world. I will not insult you by describing to you what most of my colleagues would think of tonight's debate. Remember the question about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? It's along those lines. The difference between the positions that the five of us on the stage take and the positions that is generally taken in the world that I live in are enormous. I would like us to leave the debate tonight remembering the incredible range of agreement there is among the five of us. Amen. This concludes the seventh annual Trinity Debates. I want to thank all, the, all of you for coming and for our distinguished guests here for uh, sharing their heart, sharing their minds with us. Be on the lookout in future years. We're going to try to do this annually. If you've got ideas, please let me know or let Dr. Uh, Doug Sweeney know for future debates. Why don't you join me three one more time in thanking all four of these folks for coming up here. Thank you.